Well, hello, that's me again. Today is Friday the 3rd and we have some things to discuss because obviously the situation unfolds relentlessly and we have to obviously discuss some things which make a good point, so to speak, when we discuss a special military operation. And uh, judging by the panic in the um, uh, US media and Western media and judging by the I mean, copious amount of bullshit which is being uh, poured over heads uh, of the unsuspected people uh, in the West. Let's deal with it a little bit uh, here. With the, start with that. Now, everybody talks now about the fact that Berliner Zeitung and then some Swiss outlet spoke about that uh, on January 20th, uh, the Mr. Burns, who is the uh, CIA chief, uh, told Kiev and Moscow that, you know, their uh, American plan is that, you know, Russia retains all those 20% of the territory of Ukraine and then to froze the conflict. Uh, since then, uh, and it was uh, actually Berlin, Berliner Zeitung uh, uh, reported on this yesterday, and since then there were kind of very energetic uh, um, debunkment uh, rejections of this uh, news by both Ukraine and uh, United, uh, I mean, pardon me, uh, Russia. Uh, is it, uh, as Mr. Peskov state, uh, stated there, uh, duck, so to speak, in Russian duck means utka, which is basically stuffing, basically bullshit. So is it BS? I don't think so. Obviously, everybody needs to uh, keep uh, some type of the secret diplomacy under wraps, and nobody can take uh, uh, and report on those things which happening and the bargaining which still continues, which happens between Russia and the United States, because these are the only two countries which decide now the fate of the Europe in general, and the United States is in no position to uh, offer anything. And as uh, news reported, I mean, those uh, 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 Swiss and German newspapers reported, Russia uh, rejected it outright. Then Peskov comes out uh, today and speaks that it's complete BS and it's just misinformation. Possible. But also possible that there, were, there are some very... Uh, how to say it, I would say all those convulsing movements on the part of the United States because as the uh, co copious amount of bullshit, especially from such crap and sewer as New York Times continues, we can say that something is afoot here. And here is the New York Times, which by means of course, Ukra Ukrainska Pravda, uh, the uh, outlet from Ukraine immediately caught up on that. Today reports that Russian casualties in Ukraine approaching 200,000, says New York Times. Uh, first, you need to understand that even BBC, which is this the uh, collection of the all kinds of the sexual deviants and perverts and uh, creeps, even they reported that they could uh, count only about 7,000 something killed, and uh, they say it's probably 12,000, but they say, oh, it could be even 20,000. But then again, people who go into the so-called journalism, which is not journalism, it's just propaganda lab dogs, so that's who they are, all of them, and people without any principles or ethics or morals. So, but uh, they do not study mathematics. They definitely do not understand how their operation planning is done, how they are killed in action, how the wounded in action, uh, are calculated, how they are reported, so they, but even BBC could come up with the number bigger than, uh, they say 12,000, but um, then they said, oh yeah, let's multiply it by two, it's about 20,000, okay, sure, but it's, as you can see yourself, New York, go, uh, New York Times goes and uh, gets up there to uh, one uh, order of magnitude more and say, yeah, Russians lost 200,000 killed and wounded. So, um, yeah, make uh, up your mind what do they mean by that. Obviously, Ukraine immediately reports this and the amount of bullshit and misinformation and outright, I, I mean, some crap there is so ignorant and so pathetic that you begin to only scratch your head and obviously um, in accordance to New York Times, Russia is losing. Well, Russia is losing so much that Mr. Prigozhin of the Chevaka Wagner, he asked uh, Mr. Zelensky, who 
you know, stated today that we're not gonna leave, you know, we're not gonna abandon Bakhmut, he told him, please don't. And of course, Mr. Prigozhin, uh, as many people say that he's becoming too prominent, so to speak, because of the Wagner Group. But the point is, it's not because of the Wagner Group. Wagner Group is merely uh, popular right now in the media. There are all kinds of Russian units uh, fighting there alongside, and they're pretty good, those people in Wagner Group. Please don't uh, misinterpret me. But obviously they operate within the operational plan and strategic plans as prescribed by the general staff. And they, you know, they have their own sector of responsibilities uh, and they have very good fighters there and they do their job. But Mr. Prigozhin obviously naturally because of his background and because especially due to... Uh, doing all the Western media, what they usually do, uh, it's basically baloney, it's bullshit. So he became a very serious media uh, figure of the influence. And then, of course, uh, Mr. Garenburg, uh, the only uh, connection of his uh, to Russia is the fact that he goes there. He is uh, originally a Russian Jew from, uh, I don't remember, Moscow or something like that. And he has degree in some kind of political science and something else. So in general, he is as uh, ignorant and as uh, uneducated as anybody, as any military specialist. For example, from the Central for Naval Analysis, where he works since 2000, and he passes for the specialist in Russian uh, uh, military, Russian doctrine, r Russian whatever bullshit, which requires all those generalizations, which require no serious skills or knowledge. Yet he talks about some kind in Newsweek that it is all about some kind of the struggle for the leadership position. And yeah, that's the typical level of the expertise, quote unquote, for people in these positions who primarily, and their task is to gather rumors and try to shuffle and rub shoulders with the top brass, get rumors, the snippets of information and put together into some kind of narrative without even being able to in their life to command a squad or platoon or what have you. And here we are, this is in the news week, it's now about the, some kind of the struggle for the positioning, now again continuous misinterpretations of the appointment of Mr. Gerasimov, the chief of the general staff of Russian Federation and overall commander. And that brings us to something else which I want to uh, explain because obviously the situation uh, uh, with Bakhmut and basically uh, Ukrainian front crumbling and crumbling badly. We are not talking about catastrophic losses, absolutely catastrophic losses, of course, which uh, New York Times tries to compensate by, compensate by inventing uh, uh, or numbers of Russian killed and wounded, just pulling it out of their ass, which tells you they are butthurt, plus they are preparing to abandon Ukraine as the project, as in general, basically. So, but the truth is, everything of this is happening now at the, against the background of the 80th anniversary of the, the ending of the Stalingrad battle. This battle, it's basically redefined the World War II as a whole, and it changed the balance of power dramatically, and after that battle, which ended 80 uh, years ago, uh, everything became clear that Axis forces and German National so Socialism will be defeated by the Red Army and that eventually Red Army will end up in, the, in Berlin. So, well, just to remind you something, which of course uh, everybody uh, loves to talk about, here's how uh, uh, Western public sees their uh, uh, contribution to the World War II and who did most for the uh, defeat of the Germany. As you can show yourself, Soviet Union is just, you know, was a sideshow, just nothing really. The fact that uh, almost 1.9 million people casualties have been sustained on both sides in Stalingrad battle and six parts of the 4th Panzer, uh, the one Italian, <coughs> one Romanian and Hungarian armies have been destroyed and the half a year of the European production for the, uh, for the access have been eliminated. People do not want to remember this, but look at this. 
as you can see yourself, primarily it's British and uh, United States, which really kind of won the war. Russians were there just, you know, sideshow, you know, killing about 80 plus uh, uh, percent of the creme de la creme of Wehrmacht and uh, SS and what have you. So, and I want to remind you a little bit, uh, so uh, Russian embassy in Washington DC posted this thing. This is from the uh, United States, but in appropriate uh, uh, time frame, which was, of course, Battle of Stalingrad, September 13, 1942, to January 31st, 1943, with the February 2, where the official uh, capitulation was uh, uh, basically arranged there. And look at this, what they write, those people. Look what, uh, what is written there. In the name of the people of the United States of America, I present the scroll, you know, of FDR, Franklin Villano Roosevelt, to the city of Stalingrad, to commemorate our, uh, our admiration for its gallant defenders whose courage, fortitude, and devotion during the siege of September 1342 to January 31st, 43 will inspire forever the hearts of all free people. Their glorious victory stemmed the tide of invasion and marked the turning point in the war of the allied nations against the forces of aggression. Well, then in November 1943 at the Tehran, at the big three uh, uh, meeting, summit, where there was discussion of the uh, primarily allied invasion of the Normandy, of Normandy, uh, Churchill handed Stalin this famous sword of Stalingrad. And uh, if you read attentively the accounts of those times, you will see yourself when, the Stalin, when Stalin uh, got this wonderfully made uh, sword and he kissed it and then uh, turned it to Varashilov, you would see people described Franklin Delano Roosevelt sitting in his wheelchair, almost crying. Well, actually, he was crying. He had the uh, tears running on his face because of the solemnity of this moment. And by that time, Soviet Union already did defeated Germany uh, and the best of the best and tank forces at Kursk battle, which obviously spurred the necessity to immediately co coordinate uh, invasion in Normandy uh, in 1944, the D-Day. So that was a major, major event. Well, guess what? Obviously, uh, everything what was said and described and uh, s uh, stated uh, towards the, uh, the defeat of the greatest uh, uh, military force of that time, which was, was Wehrmacht and its allies at Stalingrad, have been completely forgotten. As you already know, and I already showed it to you, majority of those people in the West, they don't know shit uh, from, from Shinola, and they think that it was uh, Anglo-American allies who basically defeated Hitler. So, sure. And that's what you get the issues with, when you have the people and you have those so-called scholars and experts in the United States who still believe that the United States defeated it all, with a little help those, you know, insignificant Ruskies. So, but obviously 80th uh, anniversary of Stalingrad and the end of the Stalingrad battle is an extremely important event and it has an, a, a huge uh, uh, symbolic significance and this is very important to keep <coughs> for people in mind, especially against the complete baloney which is streaming now uh, from all uh, basically outlet uh, anywhere, or as Garland Nixon yesterday beautifully noticed, and this is a beautiful <coughs> way of uh, doing sarcasm, here's him, breaking news, White House insider leaked that Russia will soon likely take the strategically insignificant Ukrainian town of Bakhmut in the strategically insignificant area of Donbass, resulting in the ultimate loss of the strategically insignificant nation of Ukraine. Garland nailed it here, because obviously you can it's almost tangible. You can sense the panic and desperation on the uh, uh, White House uh, part and, of course, Western uh, uh, allies, so to speak. And we can see now how the, all those things, which, especially the package, uh, yet another package of the military aid to Ukraine continue to, you know, be delivered and adopted and billions of dollars again being poured into Ukraine defense, so to speak, capability. Reality is, of course, much, much worse. We start with Leopard, Leopard 2. 
Spain wants to deliver six Leopard 2s after they will be fixed, repaired, because they are in a disastrous condition. Now what we learn, Germany is ready to send 88 uh, tanks, Leopard. But no, it's not Leopard 2, it's Leopard 1. It is absolute piece of garbage, which will not live for long. So, and now we have this. And again, I want to uh, show you something which is very uh, uh, kind of, uh, how to put it, symptomatic. Here's the, the one of the greatest scenes from David Lynch's Dune, which I, I adore. It's one of the greatest movie ever made, where we have obviously sta uh, third stage guild navigator uh, arriving to uh, Emperor Shaddam IV, and he's talking about, uh, talks to him about the, uh, we just folded space from X. Many machines on X. Be much better machines than on Rishas. And here we have to come to this conclusion, which, by the way, uh, everybody who has a half brain understand. Everything what you do today, and uh, this is about machines. And if machines on X are better than machines on Rishas, then, well, third guild stage navigator is noting this. Modern war modern state, modern geopolitics, geopolitics is driven by the machines. I'm talking not political machines. This is the only thing which they know in Washington DC, for example, because they are very uneducated people, like Mr. Garenburg, who <coughs> researches all those politics, strategies, and doctrine. Well, in reality, you either know how machines work and you produce them, or you don't. If you do not produce those machines, you are nobody in modern world. And producing serious machines, especially machines of war, which are the most complex machines, is the whole other story. That's why people go to, for many years, in those military academies, they study physics, mathematics, operations theory, tactics, strategy, operational art. <coughs> they study theory of <coughs> probability, pardon me. <coughs> Because their only task is to understand how machines translate their complexity and abilities, either to kill or produce other machines or produce products and uh, uh, <clears throat> other things, items which are crucial for the development of civilization. And especially fundamentally what is important, what is the interaction between the machine and the humans who run those machines. You cannot study this in uh, <clears throat> political science. You cannot study it in history uh, <clears throat> courses anymore. <clears throat> you cannot study them even in sociology, which I actually admit to be a kind of semi-legitimate science. You really uh, need to study sociology, granted you get the uh, proper information on the input in order not to get this uh, fundamental garbage in, garbage out. But, <clears throat> but, this is not what gives you understanding of the uh, how civilization works today, and especially so in terms of the military warfare. And here, let me explain the thing. Now, the whole new uh, shtick today is in this. <clears throat> um, people on <clears throat> old news in Reuters, they say, okay, Ukraine's new weapon will force a Russian shift. Uh, they uh, uh, reported yesterday, and this is, now Russian forces will need to adapt or face potentially catastrophic losses. The new weapon, the ground-launched small diameter bomb, will allow Ukraine military to hit targets at twice the distance reachable by the rockets it now fires from the U.S.-supplied high-mobility artillery rocket system, HIMARS. <coughs> they talk about this uh, GLSDB as some kind of uh, new weapon. Well, let's take a look what this new weapon is. As you can see yourself. <clears throat> it's from the uh, Boeing, and that's what they tell you. Increased range up to 150 kilometers, highly accurate leverages performance of SDB, all angle, all aspect attack, all weather, terrain avoidance such as mountains, cave breaching capability, launch from hidden or protected position to avoid detection, programmable fuse, blah, 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 load up uh, of up to six rockets per pod, designed for minimal collateral damage. So, uh, this is nothing more than some bomb, which is the gliding bomb, <coughs> and you stick the ro uh, rocket motor to it and throw it as much as, as long as you can do it, you know, as uh, far as you can do it. 
Uh, let me remind you something. The Tochka U missiles, Complex Luna also, and all those which uh, Ukraine eventually ran out of them, they have very few left. They fly at 120 plus kilometers, and they, unlike this gliding bomb, are uh, much faster. They fly with the velocities up to 5 Mach, Mach 5. Russians shoot them in, you know, bunches, in the huge co uh, uh, copious amounts, copious numbers. So the same goes for HIMARS. And as I already stated, you it's all about machines. Russians have this funny little thing, which is, by the way, organic for Russian uh, brigade and even battalion level, uh, you know, units. It is the uh, Tor M2. This is the article from Sputnik uh, 10 years ago, 2013. As you can see yourself, it's underlined in red. The new system is equipped with the new NIAM-338 missile, was successfully tested at the end of October 2013. And here Mr. Druzin, one of the big conscious in Almaz Ante, he talks about that basically five targets all annihilated, 100% efficiency. Now, 10 years later, what we get from Tor M2 and its performance in um, Ukraine and special military operation is astonishing. They are shooting down some things which actually, yeah, they fly hypersonic, although they were not designed to do this. And guess what they were designed to do? Those stores, they were designed to shoot down precisely the type of the target which this thing, uh, glide, uh, gliding bomb is. But here is the caveat. As already Pentagon uh, stated, that this thing is uh, not coming to Ukraine anytime soon, and it is coming something like... Uh, in nine months, I believe. So basically, it is again safe bet for uh, United States to make sure that none other system or weapon system will appear again uh, uh, in the Ukraine, in Ukraine or whatever left of it by the time when basically Ukraine will be done. And of course, we know that the front is uh, crumbling. Pardon me. I cannot turn off my phone because I was expecting the important uh, call, and as you might expect, all unimportant calls started to pour in. Anyhow, the, just kind of to wrap it up and uh, to demonstrate the issue of the, I mean, utter desperation on the part of the West, and especially those machines which deal basically non-stop defeat, if you wish, or damage to the reputation of the Western weapons, and now you can see yourself how they dance around this issue, because they don't want to send any uh, anymore there, because they know what will happen to them. Uh, people <clears throat> started to talk about yesterday about this thing, which is uh, called Barshevik, it's the hogweed, and people don't understand that this thing has been around for a while now. And here's the, um, uh, this Barshevik thing, which is capable to uh, uh, take the bearing to uh, get the uh, direction and range on the Starling uh, <coughs> terminals, which are in the foundation of the command and control and communications of the what's left of the Ukrainian armed forces. And here is the uh, 23rd of December. It's, uh, you know, months and a half ago article about this Borshevik, and they uh, basically explain to you that how uh, they work, well, they don't explain how they work, obviously, because it's very classified, but they explain how they operate already successfully in the uh, special military operation, and this is yet another machine which Russians build and which are better than on the riches, quoting third stage guild navigator, and once you have the disruption of the communications, you have the you are incurring the uh, uh, loss of the command and control on the forces. And this is what happens right now with the armed forces of Ukraine, because uh, Bolshevik or Hogweed uh, system can, I believe it can uh, uh, get the position of up to 50 terminals. And after that, uh, just recent news uh, a few days ago, uh, the whole command of the 72nd uh, Motor Rifle Brigade of Ukraine have been annihilated. Using the smart uh, shells called Kra 
Constantinople, precisely because the targeting was provided by the Bolshevik. And you, we can go on and on about those machines, which of course uh, create all the situation with the desperation in Washington, because they never expected those backward Ruskies, Ruskies to do anything like this. And now, if this wasn't uh, bad enough, here is the other thing. And this is just, you know, it cannot get any better for the combined West. And uh, now CNBC reports that sanctions on Russia oil not working, and the restrictions, they say, were invented by bureaucrats who do not understand how markets work. Industry experts tell CNBC. Um, they do not understand how anything works in Washington, D.C., because it's stuffed with people with their political science degrees and uh, degrees in uh, LGBT, uh, what have you, and... Um, here is what uh, they report. Sanctions imposed uh, by the West on Russian crude oil ex exports have so far failed completely, and the new price caps could also provide ineffective, according to the CNBC report on Friday, citing analysts. So, I mean, you shouldn't be surprised. And at this stage, I as I already stated, the worst uh, thing which uh, about this whole situation and crumbling front in Ukraine is the fact that even in Pentagon, they don't understand how modern war works. They know how to kick doors in the, uh, 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 in the uh, huts of the Afghani or Iraqi villagers, but that's about it. And when you talk about the very complex and very serious and, in, and largest in, for a long time, a largest in scale and scope operation, such as a special military operation, and mind you, it's still not war. If it would have been war, we would have been dealing with a completely different set of circumstances. So when they look at it, I mean, they are not ready. They never encountered anything like this. They don't understand how operations are calculated, how they prepared, how they planned. They don't understand what is going on in general, strategically. And now they begin to come up with all kinds of the spins and excuses, and this is the only thing they taught. They operate only in PR field. They do not have uh, knowledge of anything of substance. I know some PhDs in political science, some good people, but many of them are absolutely not well-educated people. They do not know shit from Shino. And this is what I wanted to tell you today about. Sadly, I was interrupted uh, by uh, the call, but I hope so you will forgive me for that. So, guys, this is what, uh, this is my talk to you today, and this is something for the weekend, and we will be talking about the issue of the Russian history and how it projects itself uh, generally on what is happening right now in more detail uh, after the weekend or maybe by the end of the weekend. So, what I want to say as always, please, those who like what I do, uh, subscribe to my channel, or support me on Patreon, or buy me a coffee or two. So, and I will be talking to you uh, uh, very soon. Well, have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.